Okay, everybody, it's time for Cell Processes Notes Part 2. Thanks for sticking with me. We're going to talk more about some more of those very important organelles that are inside of the cell and the important processes that they do. So let's start one that we should be a little bit familiar with, which is photosynthesis. We discussed earlier in part one how to maintain homeostasis, cells have to do several essential processes. Obtaining and using energy is one of these processes. Food contains the chemical energy and the raw materials needed for life processes. We know that plants are the only things that can make their own food. That process of food making is photosynthesis, and it takes place in the chloroplast of every plant cell. So let's dive deeper into photosynthesis. This is a picture of a chloroplast. In the center are these curly Q things called thylakoids. Now they're not magical, but all they do is they perform a chemical reaction where it takes certain molecules, breaks them apart, and then makes them into new molecules, just like we learned about in chemistry first semester. What goes into the chloroplast is light energy, water, and carbon dioxide. Look down at the bottom. You can see the complete balanced equation for this. Make sure you know the names of the, the, the symbols and the actual molecule that it's called. What comes out are called the products. So the reactants go in, the products come out. The products that photosynthesis make is sugar and oxygen, and here's their chemical symbols. So all these things, light, water and carbon dioxide go into the chloroplast. All of the molecules are broken apart, rearranged through that chemical reaction to make the products sugar, not just any sugar, but a special kind of sugar called glucose and oxygen, two things that we need to be able to survive. After photosynthesis take place, then cellular respiration occurs. Cellular respiration happens inside of the cell's mitochondria. Plant cells can do this, and so can animal cells. It's really important in both types of organisms in order to extract that energy. So that sugar glucose goes in, you, we use the chemical energy, break apart the bonds of the sugar and the oxygen, rearrange them in those little folds called cristae in the mitochondria, and out comes ATP energy, water, and carbon dioxide. ATP is the most important part, is that energy that we need. So ATP is broken apart and an incredible amount of energy is released from that chemical. Water is given off as water vapor when we breathe out, and then carbon dioxide when we breathe out. The complete balanced equation is at the bottom of the screen. All right, now I want to move on to the nucleus. Now we're just going to touch upon the nucleus a little bit. There'll be so much more detail on this next quarter, but we need to give a preview of the nucleus now. The nucleus of every cell contains DNA, short for deoxyribonucleic acid. It's the blueprint for how an organism is built. Most of the time you're going to find DNA in this stringy form called chromatin. Chromatin binds up to make chromosomes when a cell is ready to divide. It shortens up and makes this shape for cell division to make it easier. More on that next quarter. But most of this time this chromatin looks like this, kind of like a string of beads. If you were to unwind that string, you would see that twisted ladder shape of DNA. It is called a double helix. The rungs of the ladder that you can see are base pair nucleotides. These base pair nucleotides fit a certain way, and we'll talk more about that later. But we really needed to talk about the nucleus because of its BFF, the ribosomes. Ribosomes in the nucleus work together very, very closely in order to build the proteins, which is the ribosome's job. So let me show you this awesome video clip real fast, and um, it'll explain really, really well how this process works. So seriously good stuff. Don't skip it. Stated Clearly presents, what is DNA and how does it work? DNA, also known as deoxyribonucleic acid, is a molecule. It's a bunch of atoms stuck together. In the case of DNA, these atoms combine to form the shape of a long spiraling ladder, sort of like this one here. If you ever studied biology or saw the movie Jurassic Park, you probably heard that DNA acts as a blueprint or a recipe for a living thing. But how? How on earth can a mere molecule act as a blueprint for something as complex and wonderful as a tree, a dog, or a dinosaur? 
To help answer that question, let's first take a quick look at amino acids. Amino acids are tiny little chemicals inside our bodies that are so important. They're often referred to as the building blocks of life. There's about 20 different kinds, each with their own unique shape. The neat thing about them is they can be attached to each other, kind of like Legos, to produce an endless variety of larger particles known as proteins. Amino acids make up proteins. Proteins, along with other chemicals, combine to form living cells. Cells make up tissues. Tissues make up organs. And organs, when they're all put together and functioning, of course, combine to form living creatures like you and me. These proteins that make up our bodies, and keep in mind, there's millions of different kinds of proteins. They each have to be formed in the perfect shape in order to function. If they're the wrong shape, they usually won't work. That's where DNA comes in. DNA does a lot of interesting things, some of which we don't fully understand, but one of its main and most well understood functions is to tell amino acids how to line up and form themselves into the perfect protein shapes. In theory, if the right proteins are built at the right time and in the right place, everything else from cells to organs to entire creatures will come out just fine. This here is a simplified model of DNA. It shows us that the steps of the ladder are made up of four different kinds of chemicals shown here by different colors and letters. If you look at just one half of the molecule, you can read its chemical sequence or genetic code from top to bottom, sort of like a book. A single strand of DNA is extremely long, millions of letters long. It spends most of its life coiled up like a noodle living inside the nucleus or the centerpiece of a cell. Amino acids, however, live outside the nucleus in what's called the cytoplasm. To help DNA interact with the cytoplasm and convert those amino acids into proteins, special chemicals inside the nucleus make partial copies of the DNA code. These partial copies, called RNA, look a lot like DNA, but they're shorter, of course, and they're missing one of their sides. Their small shape and size allows them to fit through tiny pores in the nucleus, out to the cytoplasm, and into the mouth of another particle called a ribosome. Ribosomes are protein building machines. They read the RNA code three letters at a time, suck amino acids out of their surroundings, and stick them together in a chain according to the RNA code. As the chain grows, it bends, it folds, and it sticks to itself to form a perfectly shaped protein. Every three letters of the RNA code tell the ribosome which of the 20 different kinds of amino acids should be added next. For example, CAA tells the ribosome to grab a glutamine, AGU tells it to grab a serine, and so on. Once a protein is built, it can then go on to do a number of different things, one of which could be to help form a brand new cell. So to answer the original question, what is DNA? DNA is a molecular blueprint for a living thing. How does it work? DNA creates RNA, RNA creates protein, proteins go on to form life. This entire process, as complicated, as sophisticated, as magical as it might seem, is entirely based in chemistry. It can be studied, it can be understood. I'm John Perry, and that's DNA Stated Clearly. All right, so in that video, we were able to see how the nucleus and the ribosomes work together in order to get their jobs done. So in the nucleus, the DNA ladder unzips in half. So this partial half ladder is called RNA. Remember, there's no deoxyribo, it's just ribonucleic acid. And it's able to fit out of the nucleus and go to the ribosomes. The ribosome then reads the code in groups of three in order to form the proteins. So the whole reason the ribosomes can do their job is because of what's going on inside of the nucleus. So that code is read again in groups of three. And so for every three 
base pairs that it reads, it is able to build an amino acid onto another amino acid to finally make an entire protein. And so our body can either be made one way or another based on those proteins that are made. If there's a mistake in the reading of the strands of RNA, then the protein won't be made correctly. So either the um, code is to make an eyeball or to make a baboon's butt like you saw in the video. So depending on what's being made is in the code. So they just read the instructions of the code to build the proper protein. Well, that's all I have for you this time, everybody. I'm just going to leave you with this important graphic about how amino acids build to make complete organisms. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time. Don't forget to ask questions if you have them along the way.